Hi everyone and welcome back to the lab. In this video I'll be making iodine, elemental iodine that is. It's a crystalline purple solid at room temperature that sublimes giving off a purple vapor. It is the heaviest halogen that you can probably get your hands on as an amateur chemist and uh, the three of course being chlorine, bromine, and iodine, a gas, liquid, and solid at room temperature respectively. I'll be making the iodine by oxidizing the easily oxidized hydroiodic acid. Iodine acts as a great leaving group and so it's very easily oxidized by uh, simple things. I'm in this case using hydrogen peroxide. You can use many other things like chlorates or perchlorates or uh, permanganates or even hypochlorite, chlorine gas. There's lots of things you can use to oxidize it with, but I prefer hydrogen peroxide because it comes out with the least amount of impurities. In this case, we're just producing more water. Now to get the hydroiodic acid in the first place, I'll be reacting potassium iodide with a strong mineral acid to make the hydroiodic acid and potassium chloride. And we have to use a strong mineral acid here, of course, because hydroiodic acid is actually stronger than HCl. And although this is a, an equilibrium as set up here, um, the equilibrium actually favors this side. So um, this side will be favored until we start adding the hydrogen peroxide, at which point the iodine, which drops out of solution, will drive the reaction since the uh, iodine is no longer participating. You can use almost any strong acid that you want here. I'm using hydrochloric acid, but uh, you could use nitric acid or sulfuric acid, but you have to be careful because, as I said earlier, um, iodine is easily oxidized, and if the acid is oxidizing the iodine, then you end up with elemental iodine and then a reduced acid. And in this case, you can't really reduce this, but if you reduce, say, sulfuric acid or nitric acid, you'll end up with nitrogen oxides or sulfur oxides. And so uh, that doesn't work at... Uh, high-ish temperatures, it's kind of touchy, so HCl, since it's the cheapest and the, the easiest, it's a non-oxidizing acid, works really well for this synthesis. So let's get to the lab and uh, start doing it. I've set up for this reaction by placing 26.2 grams of solid potassium iodide in the bottom of a 200 milliliter beaker. I'll be dissolving that in approximately 50 milliliters of room temperature water. It doesn't really matter how much you use um, that much, uh, around 50 milliliters is best, but uh, adding more water will increase the amount of dissolved iodide that there is left at the end and slightly reduce your yield. Now, however, in cold water, iodine is not very soluble, so it doesn't reduce your yield by very much. So this, uh, this can be approximately. I also have uh, 25 milliliters here of 25% uh, hydrochloric acid. You can use an approximate value for this too. As you can see, I've got a little bit more than 25 milliliters here because I'm not quite sure the concentration of my acid. I haven't titrated it in the last probably six months, and it does slowly evaporate from its container, losing hydrogen chloride first since it is above its azeotrope. So I'm compensating for that there, but again, this is a really easy reaction. You don't actually need to have really exact quantities of all these things. As long as they're quite close, um, you'll be okay. And so, of course, to oxidize the, the formed hydroidic acid, I have 10 milliliters of 25%-ish. Uh, Hydrogen peroxide, again it's old, it started as 29%, I'm guessing it to be about 25, so I have a little over 10 milliliters of it. So I'll start by placing the stir bar in the potassium iodide, and uh, we'll get this stirring on a plate with the water. Potassium iodide is very soluble in water, so this won't take very long to dissolve. While this is stirring, it's a good idea to place some water in the refrigerator. Um, approximately 150 milliliters is what we'll need to wash the finished product, so I've gone ahead and done that already. And you can see the potassium iodide has uh, almost completely dissolved now, so I'm going to go ahead and add the 25 milliliters of 25% hydrochloric acid slowly. And of course make sure you wash all of your acidic glassware. Don't leave this laying around because you may mistake it for water and uh, have a bad mistake. And you see the yellowing color there of the hydrochloric acid formed and its subsequent decomposition into iodine. So. Now that everything's dissolved, it's time to go ahead and add the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, you can do this all at once. It's going to get quite warm, and some iodine will escape into the room as purple vapor. Um, that doesn't really matter too much in this reaction. We have quite a bit of volume here to absorb that heat energy. That's what all that water is for in the beginning, um, and it doesn't really contribute to much loss of yield. Otherwise, if you're really anal about it, you, want, you can cool this in the refrigerator and this as well, and then add them together slowly or something like that. Honestly, this is no need for fancy glassware. We'll just pour it. 
And you see immediately we've formed iodine and our iodine is giving off the purple vapor because it is quite warm. Well, not quite warm, but just a little bit warm. A lot of the iodine loss can be prevented by turning the, the stir bar off and uh, reducing the agitation of the mixture, which reduces its surface area with the air. And uh, I'll go ahead and do that. And in fact, I'm going to set this aside so I can set up for vacuum filtration. Okay, I'm now set up for vacuum filtration, and we'll go ahead and filter and wash the iodine. First, let me turn on the aspirator. Start suction. You can see the water was pulled out of the frit. It was just washed, so it had a little bit of water in it. And uh, we'll also need a stirring rod because the iodine is quite dense and will have mostly sunk to the bottom of the beaker, as you can see, maybe there, just some chunks. So we'll swirl it, pour it through. most of the iodine ended up in the bottom of the beaker, which we will scrape out with a rod. Apologize if my arm is in the way. Carefully, of course. Spread the corrosive stuff. Okay, and when you have a little bit left, you can go ahead and rinse uh, everything with the cold water. First, the beaker. We'll use the cold water to repeatedly wash the remaining iodine out. go. And maybe one more rinse for good measure. You can see we only have a little bit left. It's also serving to cool the iodine down, which reduces the volatilization considerably. Okay, and the rest of this, I will scrape out. Oh, actually there's really almost nothing left. Okay. So, uh, I use a stirring rod to distribute this somewhat evenly so we can commence with the washing. Which can be canted down the steering rod to clear the steering rod of iodine. And we'll just fill this up and pull the rest of this cold water through. We we'll effectively clear this of the remaining acid as well as the, uh, the unwrecked potassium iodide. Alright, and there we go. Our filtration is essentially complete. Um, I'll just leave this on the vacuum for a little while to uh, continue to pull the last remaining bits of water out of it. That's what it looks like. We can retrieve the stir bar later. While I continue to pull a vacuum on that, we'll set up a small drying pad. I've done this in previous videos, but I guess I'll show you some specifics. It's just uh, some paper towels, folded in fours, that placed at the bottom of a clean glass dish, and then a coffee filter on top of that. And that serves as a nice platform uh, on which to dump crystals, and the moisture will get whipped into the paper towel. Works really well. Okay, I've been running the aspirator for a few minutes, so I think we've got enough, uh, enough of the water pulled out of the iodine. We can go ahead and separate that now. So, turn off the aspirator here. Make sure we don't have water. Okay. You know, the aspirator's now off, and we can go ahead and scrape the iodine out of the, uh, the funnel there. I've got the drying plate ready. And I'm going to use a flat spatula like this to just scrape it out. And spread it as thinly as possible uh, so that we get drying in a reasonable amount of time. Now it does sublime at room temperature, so you will eventually lose it. So if you leave this overnight, you're going to lose all, almost all of your product. Um, so what you got to do basically is just uh, leave this out for maybe an hour or two and uh, keep keep it spread as thinly as possible throughout that hour. Uh, eventually it'll dry up enough that it won't stick to the stir bar and you can retrieve that. But uh, right now it's much too wet to do any of that, so I'm just going to do my best to spread the chunks out as much as possible and then uh, we'll come back in a few minutes once uh, most of the moisture has been wicked away by the paper towel here and then I can go ahead and re-spread that. After a bit of drying, the iodine is now a mostly free-flowing, uh, dense, sort of dark blue, maybe purple solid. And uh, I've changed this filter paper out once because it was getting uh, really saturated, and I want to try to dry the, uh, the iodine out as, as quickly as possible, of course, because it evaporates at room temperature. You can see I changed the bottom pad as well. I think this is ready for flipping over. Anyway, I'll give this another couple of minutes. Uh, iodine is... Uh, 
mostly used in wet chemistry anyway, so drying it isn't really of utmost concern unless you are uh, running something that is not tolerant to water. Um, I don't run many reactions that aren't tolerant to water that require iodine, except maybe Grignard's, and I need to uh, purify the iodine beforehand with sublimation anyway. But uh, that's sort of a subject for a future video, so I think for now this is good to go uh, and store in the storage container. And I just have a small jar here to store my iodine in, and uh, it's preferable to keep this in the refrigerator because uh, the iodine will eventually sublime, and of course you can see under there it's turned the cap purple and it will escape the container quite handedly if left to its own devices. So keep its vapor pressure as low as possible, keep it in the refrigerator. I'm going to transfer this to the container now. One of iodine's most interesting and probably most talked about its physical properties is the fact that it's sublimed. It doesn't have a liquid state at atmospheric pressure, so it goes directly from a solid to a gas. And uh, as we saw earlier, it forms a purple vapor. And so by heating this beaker, I'll be able to evaporate this iodine to form that purple vapor. Now if I place something cold on the top of the beaker, like this 50 milliliter round bottom flask, which is full of uh, pretty cold tap water, um, I'll be able to sublime the iodine off the bottom of the flask and uh, condense it, or deposit it as it's called, on the bottom of this flask. And that redeposited iodine is actually very, very pure. And that's how you uh, purify and dry your iodine. So typically you'd have a, a desiccant somewhere in here, you'd mix the iodine with the desiccant, and then you'd heat it slowly and allow it to, uh, to condense, or I guess deposit, on the bottom of this flask, and you'd end up with a bunch of crystals stuck to the bottom of the flask of dry and uh, highly pure iodine. So I'll run that on a very small scale here right now just to demonstrate the concept. Uh, because I lack the apparatus, I'm still counting my pennies to get a, a decent sublimation apparatus. I'm going to heat this with a hot air gun. Hopefully that's not too loud. And so the hot air gun is driving the iodine off the bottom of the beaker. And the vapor is traveling until it hits the cold flask. And the cold flask is causing the iodine to redeposit. And you can see the shiny crystals, maybe, on the side of the flask. Let's see what we've got. It's probably pretty hot. Nope, you can see the crystals deposited on the bottom of this flask. The camera will focus on them. Sort of a black tinge, but more importantly, on the edges of the beaker, See all the shiny crystals? That is resublimed iodine. And uh, of course, you can use that. Oh, you can see the iodine vapor is uh, discoloring my glove. It's uh, one of the bad things about nitrile gloves is that they, uh, they contain double bond and they're very easily halogenated. But anyway, that's the uh, that's purification of iodine, basically. It forms nice, beautiful crystals. And you could do this on a much larger scale. and. Uh, that's how you would purify it prior to an experiment, if your experiment required uh, further purification. And here we have a jar of iodine, slightly damp, um, but not so damp that it doesn't form a nice flowing powder, and it's ready for future use and possibly purification depending on the type of reaction. Well, if you like this video, please hit the like button. I certainly enjoyed making it. Uh, please feel free to comment. I'll try and answer as many comments as I can. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.